Well, just before we bring you the latest from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and let's bring you up to speed on what's happening in Britain. Now, it is hard for any of us to resist saying, I told you so, and uh, Michel Barnier, the former EU Brexit negotiator, is no exception. He posted a message on his uh, uh, Twitter this morning. Of course, it came before Liz Truss announced her resignation, saying that Truss was not brought down by Brexit, but she had to resign because she won the leadership and he says perhaps could only win uh, the leadership on a right-wing populist policy platform that appalled the financial markets and then the electorate well uh, uk's this trust has announced that she will be resigning as prime minister and leader of the conservative party making her the shortest serving prime minister in uk's history she made this known in a statement outside downing street today I came into office at a time of great economic and international instability. Families and businesses were worried about how to pay their bills. Putin's illegal war in Ukraine threatens the security of our whole continent. And our country has been held back for too long by low economic growth. I was elected by the Conservative Party with a mandate to change this. We delivered on energy bills and on cutting national insurance. And we set out a vision for a low tax, high growth economy that would take advantage of the freedoms of Brexit. I recognize though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. This morning, I met the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. This will ensure that we remain on a path to deliver our fiscal plans and maintain our country's economic stability and national security. I will remain as Prime Minister until a successor has been chosen. Thank you. Liz Ross announcing her resignation there as a British Prime Minister and leader of the Conservative Party. Well, were you expecting that? Our London correspondent, Juliana Lanka, joins us live from Westminster. Hi, Juliana. She promised to deliver, deliver and deliver. How is Britain reacting to this resignation? Well, uh, good afternoon, Millicent. What I can say is I think the British public want this pantomime to be over. It's pretty fair to say that the mood is there must be a general election. We've just actually heard from Sir Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Opposition Party, as well as Sir Ed Davey, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, and the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, saying that it must go to the public, that the Conservative Party cannot continue on like this. Um, according to Sir Graham Brady, the chairman of the 1922 Select Committee of Backbenchers, a successor for Liz Truss will be announced on Friday. Uh, but the British public seemingly don't want that. Uh, they feel that it's been absolutely uh, shambolic and chaotic. And I've got to tell you, and it's pretty rare, uh, militant for journalists to speak off the cuff, but it absolutely has been. Uh, just behind me, as you can see, I'm at Westminster. Yesterday afternoon, Liz Truss um, entered what was going to be um, a, a pretty tense uh, Prime Minister's questions. And one of the biggest quotes we took away uh, from PMQs yesterday is her saying, I am a fighter, not a quitter. Uh, but indeed, she was a fighter because swiftly after PMQs, she was apparently embroiled in a shouting match that lasted 45 minutes with Suella Braverman, who was uh, the Home Secretary before she tendered her resignations, tearing shreds into uh, Liz Truss's premiership. So um, I've got to tell you, the mood is uh, as gloomy as uh, the weather behind me. And I think the British public have just simply had enough of this Conservative government. They've been in power 
for 12 years. Some say it's far too long and they've got to go. And, you know, I was just going to say that, you know, what she said yesterday about being a fighter, not a quitter, and then now one wonders at exactly what point that shift occurred and that she came out today to say that uh, she was resigning. But critics, some critics say that perhaps she was never cut out for the job in the first place um, and that perhaps it is a difficult time to be uh, Prime Minister of Britain. What are you hearing? Well, that's very true. I don't think it's ever going to be an easy job uh, to be the leader of one of the world's wealthiest nations, particularly uh, when we are in a cost of living crisis. Um, inflation has reached double digits. The labour market may seem, if you look at the data, to be doing well, but most people are on zero hour contracts. Wages are not going far enough. We've had the TUC Congress a conference taking place in Brighton this week. Their outgoing general secretary is calling uh, for a winter of discontent, general strikes across the board, not just with the rail workers who have been striking all summer, uh, but among so many um, others. So it was always going to be a really difficult period uh, for Liz Truss. And some would say that, you know, she did have the support at least of um, the, the, the major party, over 166,000 eligible uh, voters. Uh, but, you know, things have gone on far too long. And I think the final now in the coffin was some extraordinary scenes um, that were witnessed in the lobby of the House of Commons yesterday evening over the fracking vote, um, allegations of bullying. Um, you know, some Conservative MPs were apparently pulled by the collar um, into uh, the chamber so that they can vote. Uh, you know, power completely yeah. broke down yesterday. And I think it's fair to say not if, but when she would be ousted. And of course, that happened this morning, as we heard from her speech. Uh, she um, informed King Charles III that she would be dissolving her government. And uh, she got the nod of that uh, from uh, the Conservative administration. The shortest serving Home Secretary, um, Breverman, in her resignation letter hinted at a dysfunction at the heart of Ms. Truss's government. Did that add more chaos to her leadership? Well, absolutely, um, it added more chaos. And listen, as I said, just shortly after PMQs, we did hear that there was a shouting match between Suella Braverman and Liz Truss. Um, we all remember that Suella Braverman was actually a contender in the leadership race. In fact, the bookies are putting her as one of the favourites to be the successor um, of Liz Truss. I think, you know, that was exceptionally painful. Let's not forget that the Home Secretary is a very important position. And her resignation came just five days after another very important position was gone. And that was the axing of the UK's first black chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, who was a staunch ally of Liz Truss. And some say, you know, he was pushed in front of the bus because he was only pronouncing um, a lot of the economic policy that Liz Truss has campaigned on uh, during uh, the summer. So there were many, many issues. I don't think she was able to unite the party. And now uh, the leadership battle continues. Um, no surprises that uh, Boris Johnson, who I believe it's currently on a very extended holiday in the Caribbean, um, is apparently putting um, his hat in uh, for the run. According to the Times and the Telegraph, um, he um, wants another shot at, you know, holding the keys to number 10, which is the most important uh, resident in the UK. I'm not sure how that's going to go down with the British public, because you'll remember he is still under investigation for allegedly lying um, in the House of Commons. So it's all, um, you know, not going very great at the moment. I think it's fair to say that Sir Keir Starmer is licking um, his lips. The Labour Party are certainly a government in waiting, but there can be no general election in this country until the Conservative Party say so. And it's just um, all to see whether or not they will do it before or after next Friday when the new Prime Minister will be announced. And, and Juliana, um, we hear that former UK Prime Minister Theresa May this time uh, tweeted um, saying that uh, Liz Truss was right to stand down as leader of the country in order to provide a roadmap for an orderly transition. She said MPs must now be prepared to compromise, saying it's our duty to provide sensible, competent government at this critical moment for our country.
So we are, we can say that Conservative Party in the UK is polling at historically low levels. Reached by um, Theresa May, that's what she would hope, that there would be some compromise, but there is anything above that. I think, you know, that first came out in the open during the leadership contest. Uh, you know, uh, there were some uh, televised debates that had to be cancelled because it was seen within the party that Liz Truss, Rishi Shunak, Penny Morden, Kemi Badenoch were all tearing uh, shreds out of each other, and there was no unity. There is so much discontent. Even yesterday evening during the brawl within the lobby, a lot of conservative backbenchers were speaking on television and, you know, they couldn't hide their dismay. They said things cannot continue like this. You know, um, a lot of people are looking for jobs in this country, but the hardest job um, to find would be for an ex-MP who's been in power uh, for 12 years. But we'll, we'll have to wait and see, Minister. This is a fast-developing uh, story. And as I said, you know, unprecedented, which is a term I've been using on a weekly basis over the couple of years, really is an understatement. It is completely chaotic and shambolic. And the fact that we've got uh, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson in the running to be the next Prime Minister after 44 days is just absolutely shocking. You say unprecedented. I say interesting. Juliana, walk us through what happens now, um, onwards, until Friday. Well, that's, that's a good question, but it's something that is so fast moving. I just couldn't give you an accurate answer. As soon as we had uh, that pretty short... Um, and a concise statement from Liz Truss at 1.30. There was then a statement delivered by Sir Graham Brady um, to journalists outside number 10. Um, he said that the, the transition is going to happen very swiftly, within a week. Um, and there are debates now about whether or not the decision is going to be passed to the wider party, which consists of over 160,000 paid up members, or if it's just going to be with the, the ministers that sit um, in the House. And that's where opposition parties are not happy. They just don't feel as if the 160,000 uh, Conservative Party members is an accurate um, uh, representation of the general public and uh, the electorate. So we'll have to wait and see, is it going to be that the 1922 Select Committee just say that Conservative MPs will vote for that leader, or are they going to bring it out? Is there even time? It's Thursday afternoon. To find a leader by Friday, is there going to be enough time to get those votes out to that wider party in time uh, uh, for this ballot? Who knows? And unfortunately, unlike what Theresa May um, is suggesting, there is no unity. We're already seeing so many people uh, believing that they have got a chance at the top job. I've got to say, I think Rishi Shunak um, is the odds-on favourite at the moment, but you just can't rule out Boris Johnson. And then, you know, we've got our, our friend of the channel, uh, Kemi Badenoch, who's currently the International Trade Secretary, she did so much better than anybody, I think even herself, uh, would have imagined. She's put her hat in the ring, as well as um, Suella Braverman. So it depends. By the end of today, I think those numbers will be whittled down. And we'll just have to wait and see tomorrow whether the legislation and the rules of the party um, uh, change or whether or not a general election uh, will be called. Honestly, Minister, you know, these are times that um, we have never seen in this country before, and it is happening uh, so quickly. But I think it's fair to say the mood of the country is they want this Conservative Party out. Thanks, Diana. We'll continue to look to you for more updates as the story develops. Thank you so much. Uh, London correspondent Juliana Lainka, night for us there at Westminster. Or staying with the top story, uh, London residents had called on Prime Minister Liz Truss to step down as she battled to retain her grip on par a day after the second top minister was replaced and significant numbers of her Conservative lawmakers defied the government and Parliament in a dramatic breakdown of unity and discipline. Just six weeks as Prime Minister, Ms Truss has been forced to abandon almost all her policy programme after it triggered a bond market route and a collapse of her approval ratings and those of her Conservative Party. Since last Friday, Ms. Truss, who has lost two of the former senior ministers in government, 
She sat expressionless in Parliament as her new finance minister ripped up her economic plans, faced howls of laughter as she tried to defend her record. It was the sight of yet another unpopular prime minister clinging to power, underscoring just how volatile British politics has become since 2016. A uh, vote to leave the European Union unleashed a battle for the direction of the country. Well, let's take a listen to what some Londoners are saying about this. We've got to get rid of her, haven't we? She's got to go. I mean, it's just such a nightmare. Everything that she promised, you know, her, her promise, uh, everything she said has been a complete U-turn at best, or a lie at worst, and she stood for being honest. Can't keep up with it for one minute. It's just changing every day. I'll be surprised if they survive the day, to be quite honest. Uh, of course it would have stabilised, but things are so destabilised as they are that um, I'm not sure it could get any worse, really. So I, I think that the issue is that they need to have some things that are in place that are stable, but Trust, trust needs to go. I, I, I don't think she can create stability. I don't think there is an ideal route out of this at the moment. Um, I do think it is really destabilising to change the leader again, but I don't feel like they've got much other option, to be honest with you, but I, I don't think there's a good choice right now, and I think they just, you know, whatever it takes to to get things calmed and to have the least impact on you know, everyday people who are just trying to get on with their lives and, 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 and not have to worry too much about paying their mortgage, paying excessive energy bills and you know, putting food on the table and keeping their homes warm over the next few months. Lots of reactions there. Well, let's go over to what's happening, the latest Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Russian Defense Ministry has said that its forces continued strikes against military and energy infrastructure targets in Ukraine. Ministry spokesperson Igor Konashenkov said in a statement the attacks were carried out with high-precision, long-range air-based weapons. The targets were military command and energy infrastructure of Ukraine. All assigned objects were hit. According to Konashenkov, Ukrainian troops tried to break through the Russian defences in the Kherson region, but the Russian military managed to repel the attack. Russia has in recent days attacked Ukraine's civilian infrastructure, including energy facilities, after suffering a series of defeats on the battlefield in September. Earlier, Ukrainian president said Russia had destroyed 30 percent of Ukraine's power stations in what he called terrorist attacks. A Soviet-era monument in the south Ukrainian city of Mykolaiv was destroyed in an explosion late Wednesday evening. The monument is controversial among Mykolaiv residents as it's dedicated to Soviet police officers that gave their lives in the Second World War. The Mykolaiv regional governor, Vitaly Kim, said on Telegram the destruction of the memorial had solved the controversy. Epic, the Russians have just solved the problem with the memorial. Ukrainian media reported October 13 that people tried to remove the monument and scuffled with veterans of the Ukrainian Interior Ministry. One Mykolaiv resident said that he believes people misunderstand the meaning of the monument. The Cheka was a secret police in the early Soviet Union founded in 1917, a precursor of the Soviet KGB. Eyewitnesses said five drones hit the southern port city of Mykolaiv early this morning, but it was unclear where they had exploded. Repairs to the bridge uh, between the annexed Crimean Peninsula and southern Russia, which was damaged in an explosion October 8, were shown to be underway in a footage released today by Russia's, uh, Russia's RIA Novosti uh, news agency. Cranes and construction work could be seen, as well as the traffic freely flowing in both directions on an undamaged section of the bridge. The repair work is scheduled to be finished by July 2023, a document published on the Russian government's website said the Crimea Bridge, a showcase project of Russia's president's rule, was damaged in a blast uh, that Russia has blamed on Ukraine. Some Ukrainian officials celebrated the incident, but Kyiv has not claimed responsibility. Russian President Vladimir Putin is using energy as a weapon, but has failed to break the West's unity and will not achieve his war aims through scorched earth tactics. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz was speaking to Parliament where he also said Germany had freed itself from dependence on Russian gas 
and was working to bring energy prices down, but warns the EU imposing a gas price cap risks backfiring. Now, the Russian army has pummeled Ukraine's energy infrastructure in recent days, causing blackouts and prompting Ukraine to introduce curbs on electricity usage for the first time since the Russian invasion in February. Mr. Shaw's warns that Putin warns Putin that deliberate attacks on the civilian population are war crimes. Russia has denied targeting civilians. While saying the EU would not let Moscow's latest escalation go unanswered, he also said uh, that they will only strengthen the unity and resolve of Ukraine and its partners. Mr. Schultz was speaking as leaders of the 27 European Union countries prepared to meet for the second time in two weeks to try to bring down energy prices, though divisions persist over moves to cap gas prices. Joining us now from Kyiv, Anna Chenikova, VOA's uh, Anna Chenikova. Thank you, Anna. Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. And now let's talk about um, what President Volodymyr Zelensky has said, um, appealing uh, Ukrainians uh, to curb the energy use after warning Russian attacks uh, had damaged 30% of power stations um, in the country. How bad is this and what's been the impact? Good evening. Uh well, the situation with energy uh, supply and power supply uh, in Ukraine, um, of course, uh, has certain problems uh, and uh, um, different areas have different level of damages of, of its infrastructure, um, energy infrastructure. And uh, today is the first day that government uh, implemented this uh, scheduled uh, shortages of electricity. So basically how it works that uh, there is a schedule for every city um, where uh, where people see when exactly uh, the electricity shortcut would be, and uh, basically this uh, this is done in order to uh, to, to stabilize uh, the power system, the electricity system, uh, and uh, for instance in Kiev, um, it, it it is uh, basically how it works again in each in every uh, city there is this. Uh, power supply company and uh, I can talk about Kyiv in particular that Kyiv citizens have uh, a chance to go online and check uh, they just put in their street na name and uh, apartment building number and they can check uh, when exactly the electricity shortcut would happen so then basically people have time to prepare they know in advance when the when they will know uh, where when there will be uh, no electricity and um, this is done uh, equally so basically when uh, Kyiv consumes less then there is more chances for outskirts of, of Kyiv of the capital to get uh, stabilization of the power system and so on and so forth and this works in different um, cities and in different regions uh, similarly so basically this is uh, such a huge uh, country-wise uh, stabilization procedure. Uh, uh, for the moment, uh, we know that this is planned for, uh, well, for the next week, for sure, uh, it will continue. So today was the first day. Uh, starting from today, the schedules are working. Uh, and uh, we don't know for the moment how long will it take. Uh, but for instance, the schedule is uh, the following that um, there is in Kyiv, for, for instance, there is four hours of electricity shortage per day uh, for every district. Uh, and uh, if we talk about uh, outskirts of the capital, uh, this could be different. So it could be twice or once. It depends on the situation with the power system. And of course, there are some areas, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, in the West, there are some territories where there are more problems with electricity than uh, in Kyiv or in uh, uh, other parts of the country, but still this all is very individual and it's all done uh, more or less equally so people uh, do have electricity a certain period of time during the day. Uh, what is important to say is that it's not a blackout, it's shortage, so uh, critical uh, institutions such as hospitals uh, working uh, fine, so they don't have any shortages and also water supply is working so there is no short uh, so there is no uh, problem with uh, for the uh, water pump pumping stations and so on and so forth at least in the areas that don't have uh, you know more damages than 
than needed for to, to make sure that this critical um, uh, critical things could still continue to work. So uh, for the moment, this is how it works. And of course, government is asking additionally that citizens reduce the use of electricity, especially during this rush periods uh, in the morning and in the evening. Uh, but still, people are well. People are quite. Uh, calm about this, especially taking into consideration that they know in advance uh, how it will work. So, uh, for instance, tomorrow uh, my district uh, would be uh, without electricity during the early morning, so I have a chance to plan my day uh, taking this into account. So you're also saying with the rationing of electricity, people are, are calm, they're not worried um, about it, are they also not worried as to if there are more strikes on critical infrastructure, what could happen uh, to them, to their families? Well, of course, there is, uh, you know, uh, there is a feeling that uh, something could happen and the situation could get worse. There is an understanding of this. So I cannot say that people are scared of this. This is an unfortunate consequence that could happen and people understand this. Uh, but this is not something that made people, you know, um, devastated because they're not going to have electricity for a certain period of time. Um, so uh, people just, um, I think, morally are getting ready that this situation could happen. Uh, and of course, strikes are going on, strikes continue every day, uh, and, um, and the risks are very high. But still, for the moment, uh, having these schedules, making people feel well, it's quite calm uh, in terms of understanding of the situation. So for the moment, again, people do not really, um, you know, panic too much, uh, understanding that they still would have this, you know, even if something really bad happens, they will be, uh, you know, they will be informed. So for instance, uh, I know that a lot of people are buying like additionally some candles in case, you know, they would need uh, some additional source of lightning uh, if, if the problem with electricity would be longer than just one day. Uh, but, uh, and similarly with drinking water, but it's not, you know, it's not the scale of, uh, it's not a huge scale. So people just, you know, reasonable and uh, they understand the risk, but uh, they are quite, stay quite calm with this and just, you know, taking, taking possible consequences that could, that could be. And uh, talk to us about Kherson. Um, yesterday's headline, it was about evacuating uh, people from that city, 50,000 to 60,000, uh, because they were anticipating a Ukrainian counteroffensive. Uh, well, Ukrainian, um, so we hear that a Russian uh, side uh, announced so-called evacuation. Ukrainian uh, side and Ukrainian officials and authorities call this, uh, do not call this evacuation. They, they call this deportation of people because basically Russian forces uh, occupy these territories and now they try to move people from these territories. But anyways, uh, what we hear and what we have confirmed from the Russian side that actually they move uh, some of their, uh, so well, again, so-called uh, representatives of, of Russian side, uh, the heads of uh, Russian uh, authorities there in, in uh, the city of Kherson and in Kherson region, they move them from the right bank of the river to the left bank of the river. Uh, and also we hear that they move uh, the families of these uh, people who are uh, basically in charge of, of the region from the Russian side uh, for this moment. Um, uh, we don't have exact information and we cannot independently verify whether people are actually moved or they uh, and how many of those moved and if it's uh, actually organized uh, uh, in, in a certain way. But uh, we hear that the, the active movement of Russian representatives is happening um, what Ukrainian side is saying that uh, Ukrainian forces continue counteroffensive, continue advance. We don't get any details on that. So for this past couple of weeks, we don't really hear a lot about um, what exactly uh, is happening in that area in terms of Ukrainian advance. Uh, but we hear that uh, actions are are going on, and um, also we understand that uh, taking uh, considering that. Uh, all the bridges, 
uh, from the right bank of the of the Kherson region uh, to the left bank are uh, actually e either heavily damaged or destroyed. It makes uh, a lot of difficulties for Russian forces to actually move uh, on the other side of the river. And I will just explain quickly that the city of Kherson itself is located on the right bank of the of the river of Dnipro. So basically, uh, if Russian forces uh, go to the left bank of the river, uh, this would mean that they would uh, give away uh, the city of Kherson, the center, the, this big center of, of all the south uh, area of Ukraine. And, you know, with this, we also heard Russian president announce something of a martial law for, you know, those um, um, areas, uh, annex, it causes annex regions um, of Ukraine. And, you know, we wonder what is to come uh, for some of this region. And I believe Kherson is also one of them. Yes. Uh, yes, right. Uh, but uh, again, this annexation was not accepted by anyone ex except Russia and, and uh, neither Ukraine nor international society did accept this. So uh, you, as Ukrainian officials said yesterday, uh, this announcement by President Putin would not change anything for Ukraine, for Ukrainian forces. They will continue to do what they have to do in order to liberate the territories. And also what was mentioned that actually this uh, war situation uh, um, zone, which basically was announced by President Putin yesterday, it is actually It is actually active in this region since 24th of February. So this is what U Ukrainian officials uh, specified and highlighted. So basically, um, this for Ukrainian side, it's not going to make any difference, and uh, Ukrainian uh, forces are uh, are determined to to do what they have to do. VOA's Anna Chenikova. Thanks a lot, Anna. Continue to stay, stay, stay safe. And I do apologize, uh, rationing of electricity. I hope we will continue to talk to you. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, it's back now. So. And for some more stories staying with uh, the Ukraine conflict, Russia's foreign ministry says Moscow was ready to boost exports of food and fertilizer to help avert a global food crisis, but was being blocked from doing so by the United States. Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova said Washington was blackmailing and persecuting those that tried to trade with Russia and was therefore compromising global food security. The U.S. has not directly targeted Russian agricultural exports, but sanctions on Russia's shipping insurance, logistics and payment infrastructure thwarting Russia's ability to export crucial fertilizers and also chemicals. The United States says it was no surprise Russia was resorting to desperate tactics after Russian presidents declared martial law in four partially occupied regions of Ukraine that Russia claims as its own. State Department Deputy Spokesperson Vedant Patel says it should be no surprise to anyone that Russia was resorting to this desperate tactics. It should be no surprise to anybody that Russia is resorting to desperate tactics to try and enforce control in these areas. Uh, the truth is, is that Russia is not wanted in these regions and the people of Ukraine are rejecting Russia's illegal invasion and seizure by force of what is Ukrainian territory. Uh, no matter what the Kremlin says or does, uh, no matter what they try to enact via decree, via paper or otherwise, Crimea, Donetsk, Kherson, Hans, and Zaporizhia are Ukrainian sovereign territory. And any claim that Russia makes over these territories is illegitimate. Uh, they have no legal claim whatsoever. There is no jurisdiction that they have over those territories. Uh, this is Ukraine's land, and Russia has blatantly violated uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity, as well as violating the UN Charter with their illegal act. Meanwhile, British Defense Minister Ben Wallace met his U.S. counterpart in Washington this week to discuss shared security concerns about the situation in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Britain's Chief of Defense Staff, Tony Radekin, has urged the international community to remain united against what he called Russia's president, uh, Russian president's deeply irresponsible nuclear rhetoric. He has few options left. 
Hence the nuclear rhetoric. And while this is worrying and deeply irresponsible, it is a sign of weakness, which is precisely why the international community needs to remain strong and united. I don't think you'll be surprised for me to, to duck giving you a precise uh, likelihood of, of, of where Russia is. I would just stress the recklessness of Russia using that language around nuclear and that this is a, this is a, a, a desperate and reflects the weakness of Russia. And we should, we should continue to have the confidence that we have both in our own armed forces, in our collective security that we get through NATO, and in the wider security that we get from an international community that has remained steadfast throughout this conflict. Um, Admiral, thank you for that. Russia's foreign ministry says that European Union weapons supplies to Kyiv made the bloc party to the conflict in Ukraine and that countries pumping Ukraine with weapons were sponsors of terrorism. In a briefing in Moscow, spokeswoman uh, Maria Zakharova repeated Moscow's aggressive criticism of the West for shipping billions of dollars worth of advanced arms to Ukraine to help Kyiv defend itself against Russia's eight-month military campaign. Leaders of the 27 European Union countries met today for the second time in a fortnight to try to bring down energy prices. The countries are expected to back an alternative price benchmark for liquefied natural gas and joint gas buying after earlier agreeing to cut consumption and introduce levies on windfall profits in the energy industry. But they remained split as they were months ago on whether and how to cap gas prices to stem high inflation and stave off recession. I know that Europeans are concerned, concerned about inflation, concerned about the energy bills, concerned about the winter. The best response to Putin's gas blackmail is European solidarity and European unity. And in this spirit, in this spirit, the Commission agreed yesterday on a strong legislative framework to address the energy crisis. This is a good package because this is a good basis building uh, on the tools we had in the past in order, to, in order to take additional steps and to clarify what we want for the future. The European Council tomorrow will be difficult. It will be complex because there are different sensitivities, different opinions. We do not have all the same starting points, but I see two important elements. First question, are we ready to work together in order to implement measures to lower the prices of gas? We continue in Asia, where about 21 million Malaysians eligible to vote will head to the polls November 19 for the country's next general election. Mm -hmm. The country's election commission chairman, Abdul Ghani Saleh, says campaigning will be held for two weeks and candidates will have to file their nomination to be lawmaker November 5th. Prime Minister Ismail Sabri Yaqob, who has been nominated as the United Malays National Organization's Prime Minister candidate again, dissolved Parliament October 10th and called for snap polls, saying an election would end years of political instability in the country. Elsewhere, images posted on social media show debris and a vehicle ablaze on the street in Chad's capital in Jemena. Anti-government protesters ransacked and torched the party headquarters of Chad's newly appointed Prime Minister Saleh Kebzabo this morning as security forces dispersed demonstrations calling for quicker transition to democratic rule. The vast military-run Central African nation has been on edge since the sudden death in April 2021 of President Idris Derby, who ruled with an iron fist for three decades. Mr. Derby was killed while visiting troops fighting rebels. There's been resistance to a transitional military council headed by Derby's son, who took power after the president's death and pushed back elections to October 2024. Still on the African continent, traders in Accra, Ghana, they've closed their shops to protest worsening economic 
conditions. This is coming after the SEDI plummeted to a new low of 12.3 to the dollar on Wednesday compared to 10.5 last week as inflation surges despite repeated rate hikes by the central bank. Streets are quiet in the normally bustling heart of Accra Central Business District as shops are closed in protest of the currency decline. Ghana's government is in the process of negotiating a support package with the International Monetary Fund, but some merchants say that help is not coming fast enough. Because of this dollar, that is why we close the shop. The dollar is increased all the time. Day in, day out, the dollar is going up now. When you go to Habo, you want to throw your things, it's too much for us. 53-year-old Finn, who has managed his family's small stationery store for two decades, says he can no longer afford to buy books and paper from his suppliers because of the worsening exchange rate. Finn is a member of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, which called for all its members in Accra to suspend activities from Wednesday to Monday, October 24th, in protest. I have to pay tax. I have to pay rent bill, the percentage I have to, I mean, AMA, so many taxes I have to pay. And today, if I have a shop, I open this shop, I can make a, what do you call it, a small donation to Susu so that I'll pay. But because of the hardship, so we all decided to close the shop. The government spokesman did not immediately respond to requests for comment. In one usually crowded street market downtown, about half to two-thirds of shops were closed while some activity carried on. Bookseller Alfred Kobani Otswa, who is not a member of the union, said his business was suffering too, but he did not see a strike as a solution. If you close shop till Monday, when you open shop on Monday, the government is not going to reduce the rate of the dollar. It will probably increase. It might go to um, 14 or 15 cities by Monday. Who loses? Showing his wares on the small nook of a balcony downtown, he said he couldn't afford to close his shop for even a day. For now, he will leave it in fate's hands. Southern Africa, but to health, Kenya has reported an outbreak of cholera in six out of 47 counties after recording 61 cases of the disease. According to the health ministry, 13 people were admitted to hospitals and eight others had already been discharged, while 40 were being treated as outpatient. The ministry says drought in many parts of the country may worsen the outbreak and has put all counties on high alert. Most of the cases are in the capital, Nairobi, and neighboring Kiambu County, with 48 cases. The rest of the cases are spread in the Rift Valley counties of Nakuru, Kejido, and Usain Gishu, and one case in the central Muranga County. However, the ministry has sent out experts to the affected counties to respond to the outbreak. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization chief is warning that there are now 60 confirmed and 20 probable cases of the Ebola virus disease in Uganda, with 44 deaths and 25 people that have recovered. He also shed light on the problem with the current cholera outbreak. Since 2013, WHO, UNICEF, Medicine Sans Frontiers and the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies have jointly managed a global stockpile of cholera vaccines to help control epidemics. Now to Ebola outbreak in Uganda. In total, there have, there have now been 60 confirmed and 20 probable cases with 44 deaths and 25 people have recovered. We remain concerned that there may be more chains of transmission and more contacts than we know about in the affected communities. The Ministry of Health is investigating the most recent eight cases. As initial reports indicate, they were not among known contacts. Now to cholera. Around the world, 
29 countries have reported outbreaks this year, including 13 countries that did not have outbreaks last year. Cholera is highly dangerous and can kill within a day, but it can be prevented with two doses of safe and effective oral vaccines. Since 2013, WHO, UNICEF, Medicines and Frontier, and the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies have jointly managed a global stockpile of cholera vaccines to help control epidemics. While still staying with the World Health Organization, uh, the UN Secretary General this time around, Antonio Guterres, has said that the world is moving backwards and the international community faces a harsh truth concerning the eradication of poverty. During the event at the UN headquarters to commemorate the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty, he notes that COVID-19 plunged millions into poverty, setting back more than four years of hard-won progress. International Day for the Eradication of Poverty we face a harsh truth. The world is moving backwards. COVID-19 plunged millions into poverty, setting back more than four years of hard-won progress. Inequalities are widening. National and household economies are battered by job losses, skyrocketing food and energy prices, and the gathering shadows of a global recession. The International Day for Eradication of Poverty is a wake-up call to the world. This year's theme, Dignity for All in Practice, must be a rallying cry for urgent global action. Action to invest in people-centered solutions, from health and decent work to gender equality, social protection, and transformed food and education systems. Action to transform a morally bankrupt global financial system and ensure access to financing and debt relief for all countries. The war in Ukraine is only one of the many armed conflicts globally, none of which should have been ignited in the first place. But compounded with the pandemic, this war has had a devastating impact on the poorest of the world. It has been hindering food production, disrupting food, fertilizer and energy supply chains and triggering inflation. And finally on the program, Paris is staking um, a claim to being a global centre for contemporary art sales with a revamped fair that hopes to woo more international buyers and build on the attraction of the city's rich cultural legacy. The event, Paris Plus Par Art Basel, was awarded to Art Basel, one of the giants in the art world, which hosts fairs in Switzerland as well as Miami and Hong Kong. Organizers and gallery owners are expressing optimism for bumper sales, especially as the in-person art scene reawakened after the COVID-19 pandemic and social media providing greater virtual marketing opportunities. Pieces by Pablo Picasso, Tom Whistleman, Henry Matisse, Joanne um, Michel, Edvard Munch and more recent works by artists such as uh, Shaba Lala, uh, self, Maxwell Alexandra and Soon Tie are on display. They range in prices from 1,000 to 30 million euros. And that's our program this evening. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Antwonka. Bye for now.